to Plymouth Railway Station, formerly known as North Road. From here, the southbound lines wind west through Cornwall. Cornwall, or Curno, is famous for its rich mining heritage, its amazing beaches and the stunning landscapes and properties that litter the duchy. But few people realise the importance of the railway of connecting all these things together. I'm Rosalind and I live in Cornwall. And I'm James and I'm a rail enthusiast. We're going to take you on a tour of the railways of Cornwall. I've been working on the rail. series was about the railways of Cornwall. So why are we starting in Devon? Isn't this the wrong side of the Tamar? Very true, we are on the wrong side of the Tamar. However, our first branch line, the Tamar Valley Line, starts here in Plymouth. It then follows the Devon side of the River Tamar to the Cowstock Viaduct, where it crosses back into Cornwall and to our first two stations, Cowstock and Gunners Lake. If we're going to do all the branch lines in Cornwall, we can't leave this one out. The railways reached Plymouth in 1849, although it terminated at Millbay Station, which is about a mile to the west of here. Plymouth Railway Station, as you can see behind us, was first built in 1877. It was renovated in 1938, but they had to pause during the war, so it was only actually finished in 1962. However, as you can see here, it's being re-re-renovated into this beautiful structure. I can't wait to go on this railway line. I've never been on it before. Have you, James? No, this will be my first time on this one. Wow, this must be one of the few railway lines in Cornwall that James hasn't been on. So here we are on the Tamar Valley Line. It used to be known as the East Cornwall Mineral Railway. But what minerals did it transport? The railway carried copper, tin and arsenic from the mines on Bodmin Moor down to the River Tamar so they could be shipped away. <laughs> just outside Plymouth. This was so that there would be two routes into Plymouth, so if one got bombed, the other one would still be there. The next bridge we're about to cross is over the River Tavy. This is one of the major rivers in Devon and flows from Dartmoor. You can now see it. Isn't it beautiful? At this point on the journey, the driver, who is now conveniently walking just outside, is running round the train. This is due to Bear Alston being a junction station from where the old Callington branch line, which we're about to join, diverts from the Plymouth to Oakhampton main line. We seem to be going quite slowly. Is that so that we can enjoy the beautiful view? Not quite. This railway was originally built as a mineral railway. This means it was allowed to do much tighter turns and much steeper gradients. As a consequence, it means the speed limits are a lot slower. We've just crossed the Calstock Viaduct. We're now in Cornwall. Now it's time for a cream tea. Mineral Railway. In 1908, this beautiful viaduct was completed and linked Calstock to Plymouth for both minerals and passengers. The viaduct here 
uses over 11,000 blocks of granite that have been shipped all the way from Dartmoor to build the structure. It stands at 37 metres tall and had to be built that high to still allow shipping to reach the quays here in Calstock. The bridge's length is 240 metres with 12 arches and the centre line you see behind me is the Devon Cornwall border boundary. We're down on the quays at That'll be a geese. <laughs> <laughs> We're down on the quays at Calstock. The boats would have come here to collect the mineral ores at high tide, such as this. But how did it get from up here to down here? They used something called an incline lift to get the ore from Calstock behind us down to the quay. This used a rope connected to two lots of wagons, one at the top of the hill and one at the bottom and they used both gravity and a steam engine in order to allow the trains to come safely down to the quayside. James, is this line electrified? Sadly not. Uh, it's quite expensive to electrify a railway and this line doesn't have enough passengers on a regular basis to use electric, so therefore, good old fashioned diesel. Great. This here is the original station board for Calstock and this was very typical for many stations dotted along Cornwall. It was gifted back to the station on the station's 107th birthday. As we pass these dramatic rolling hills, we're heading to Gunners Lake. It is the current end of the Tamar Valley Line. At Gunners Lake, although our train has to stop here, the line used to continue beyond over towards Callington and the, and the mineral mines. This is where the copper, arsenic and tin was originally brought down from to Callington. Because of the topography of the land, it's still much quicker to go by train from Gunners Lake to Plymouth than to drive all the way round the rivers. <laughs> Stock viaduct. It is one of the few bits of level bits of track on this line. This is because of the hilly terrain around here. It means that it has, the train has to keep going up and down, up and down in order to get over the hills. Unlike cars, trains can't go up a very steep gradient. In fact, the absolute steepest gradient is 1 in 36. At Bear Alston Station, the train has to make a very angular turn. In order to do this, it pulls into a siding and leaves in another direction. To achieve this, the conductor uses the token to unlock the sets of points at the end of the station. This allows her to change the points in order for the train to go onto the new line. walked two minutes from St Budo Victoria Road Station to here, St Budo Ferry Road Station. Now, you might wonder why there are two stations so very close together. The reason being was these two stations were built by two rival railway companies. The Great Western were built St Budo's Ferry Road, where we're standing on now, and the London and South Western Railway built their St Budo's uh, Victoria Road from where we've just come from. Both companies wanted to get to the elusive prize of having a station in Plymouth and both joined for, their, for the final stretch just down here at the end of the tracks. Yeah. And it's designed to detect when trains in a certain block of risk. Yeah. So, yeah, it's quite cool because this, this line has to get up there. So from Plymouth, both lines run parallel to each other. When we get to St Budo, St Budo, just before our lines split, I go over to Ferry Road and you head over to Victoria Road. I then come up and over while you go under and then I come around over, over the big bridge and you go straight under. So I end up in Cornwall and you end up in Gunners Lake. Not, I don't know. Not really much else, really. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We can talk. So we might have to flag down the train, by the way. Oh, cool. Is it a request stop?
This Great Western Railway logo on the side of this bench has the exact chocolate and cream colour scheme of the Great Western Railway coaches. If you ask someone if they've been to Cornwall, chances are they'll either say that they've been on holiday in Cornwall or that they'd love to go on holiday in Cornwall. From its picturesque beaches to its stunning coastline and of course the famous Cornish cream tea. However, if you come by train you get the added benefit of the spectacular views of the River Tamar from the Royal Albert Bridge. And look, there it is. Unlike at Bear Alston Station, the points box here at Saltash is electrified so the conductor does not have to get off the train in order to change the points. Also, the speed limit on this bridge is 15 miles per hour. So far we've started in Plymouth and we've been all the way along the Tamar Valley Line. Oops. This is Plymouth train station. From Plymouth, we've curved up through the city, all the way up the River Tamar, until we had to do the change back at Bear Alston, where we were able to go up to Cowstock and Gunners Lake, over the Cowstock Viaduct. Then, when we were back in Plymouth, we took the train out, it diverged at St Budo, went across the bridge and here we are in Saltash. The Royal Albert Bridge, as you see behind us, was opened in 1859 by Prince Albert. It was both designed and built by Isambard Kingdom Brunel just one year before he died. The unique lenticular design and height of 30.5 metres above the River Tamar was demanded by the Royal Navy in order for its tall ships to have clear passage up the River Tamar. We've now moved on to Liscard Railway Station, the junction station for the Lou Valley Line. Here, the branch line ends at a 90 degrees from the actual station behind us. If you came here in 1827, there would not yet be a railway. However, there would be a brand new canal. The lands around Liscard and Lou are fantastic for agriculture. However, they're quite acidic. Luckily, the sea sand at Lou is very alkaline. This means it could be shipped up on the canal and spread over the fields. Let's go to Lou then. Right. Although Cornwall has lots of tin, copper and granite, it does not have any coal streams. Back in the days of steam, coal was sourced cheaply from Welsh mines to power the steam engines. Welsh coal was preferred by the railways, as burning it in the boilers produced an almost smokeless steam. However, the last commercial coal mine in Wales closed in 2008. This means coal is now sourced from overseas to keep heritage railways like the Bolman and Wenford running. Just getting off the train here at Lou, the driver has informed us that this train is 35 years young. Nice. It looks nicer, the rocks, but I think it would have been nicer when they had the flowers there. A bit less maintenance. Yeah. There's been a bit of a whistle stop tour here. <laughs> Lou has become famous as a tourist destination thanks to its cobble streets and picturesque harbour. It's also well known for its shark angling. Oh look, that might be a shark there! You might not know this, but Lou actually consists of two towns. East Lou and 
West Loop, and this fantastic bridge connects the two together. Here on the east side, it's sandy, whereas on the west side, it's mostly housing. You can see why most of the tourists come to the east side. Lou used to be Cornwall's second largest fishing village. Sadly, the fish market here closed in 2019. But fear not, you can still get your local fish here. This is the very beach they would have collected sand from. It was shipped onto a train and then it was carried all the way up to Liscard to be spread on the fields. We're just coming up to St Keen's Wishing Well Halt. St Keen Wishing Well Halt is Cornwall's least used railway station. Last year, only an average of four people a week got on or off here. Just half a mile south of here is the Wishing Well dedicated to St Keen the 5th century Welsh princess and hermitess who travelled throughout Wales and Cornwall. Some scholars think she must have been a man because it was out of character for a woman to travel at this time. St Keen allegedly laid a spell on this well. It certainly has a mystical feel. Some say that the spell went, the quality that man or wife attains, whom chance or choice attains, first of this stream to drink, thereby mastery gains. This meant that the first marriage partner to drink from the well would have supremacy. This was very popular in Victorian times. I imagine lots of women in their wedding dresses would run down here to take the first sip. There is a very special museum right next to the station. Magnificent music machines. It has fairground organs, orchestrians, musical boxes and Wurlitzer theatre organs. But sadly, it closed in 2012. This part of the track is extremely squeaky because it has to turn such a tight corner. of a signal box. When it was built, it had 36 levers to control all the points and signals around this guard. However, today there are only 17 in use. Hitachi. Hitachi. It's, that was a Hitachi, Hitachi. train. Hitachi. It's a combined electric and diesel. Before 1901, passengers getting off here at Liscard to go to Loo could not change at this station. They'd have to do a 12 minute walk down the hill to Coombe Junction Halt, just as we're about to do now. But imagine that with a knapsack, trunk or a suitcase. Between Coombe Junction Halt and Liscard is a very steep hill. It is far too steep for a train to go up, so the train makes a detour round a big loop all the way up to Liscard. We're here at Coombe Junction Halt, which only has two stops a day. The line down here was built in 1870 to replace the canal. Initially, the Loo Valley Line was only for freight. Very occasionally, the train would allow passengers on, but they would only charge to transport your hat or umbrella. This meant that the passengers themselves went for free. As you can see, this part of the line does not have many weeds, as it is still in use today. While the line that continues on over to Moors Water and the mines beyond has not been used since 2020, as seen by the weeds. Here at Coombe Junction, the line from Lou and the Horseshoe Curve from Liscard join together. Before the train gets here, and after it has left, the conductor gets out to change the points.
Here, we can see some 8mm CN silent film, kindly shared with us by Gordon Crapper. The footage depicts the Padstow Railway, which has since been closed and reopened as the Camel Cycle Trail. So why were so many railways in Cornwall shut down? Lines used to run to destinations like Bude, Launceston and Perrinporth. This is linked to the 1963 reshaping of Britain's Railways report by Dr Richard Beeching, which was made to refine the railway network to reduce operating costs and duplicating services. This proved incredibly unpopular as many remote communities lost access to transport. We've started all the way from Plymouth to the north, down the Cornish Spine, to we've just got to here. and we're going to take the next train to Falmouth. We should be departing here in about 25 minutes. Here is the beginning of the Maritime Line. We're going to ride it all the way to Falmouth. down the line from Truro is Perrinwell, the Maritime Line's least used station. And not far from here is a very special railway, the Redruth and Chasewater Railway. Walking along the Bisso Trail, we're now following the course of Cornwall's oldest railway line. There haven't been any trains along here since 1915, but it's now much loved by cyclists, as it's so flat. The Red Roof and Chasewater Railway opened in 1825. However, steam engines were not originally used on the line. Instead, it was horses that pulled the wagons full of copper down from Gwenap to the port at Deveron. Horses were fine for the time being. Here I have a halfpenny to represent the copper. However, as the lows became greater, steam engines were acquired. As you can see, a steam engine can carry a lot more hay pennies than the horse can. Coal was also brought down from Wales to power the steam engines and the mines. Can you see if we can try and get another hay penny on the donkey? Let's see if he can, he's got a bit more strength than him. A bit more. We've hopped off the train here at Penryn, the busiest station on the Maritime Line. In this station's history, there has been three different configurations of platforms here. The first two stations were here where this car park now is, but there weren't enough sidings for the town. The second Penryn station was built here in 1923 where they cut into the hillside over here to form two new platforms. The third platform is this long platform as you see here today. It was constructed in 2008 and funded by the European Union. This helped re-establish the half hourly service we now see on the Maritime Line. The Maritime Line is only single track but has two trains running. What happens at Penryn Station to allow the two trains to pass each other? Firstly, the Falmouth train arrives and enters the north platform on the loop. It waits in the station while the point on each side of the loop switches. The Truro train can then pass the Falmouth train and reach the south platform. The points switch again, allowing the Falmouth train to continue to Truro. Falmouth Docks used to be the only station in Falmouth. The station building and the sidings have now been replaced by the student buildings and the car park. Although you can't see any of the sidings going down to the docks anymore, you can see them from the top of the hill.
This mosaic over here at Falmouth Dock Station depicts the importance of the maritime line for Falmouth. You can see Pendennis Castle, the National Maritime Museum and the historic docks. noise and bustle since the 17th century. This is because of Falmouth's deep natural harbour. In fact, it's the deepest natural harbour in Europe. Falmouth docks played a critical role in the lead up to the Normandy landings of 1944 where ships came here to be refurbished. As you can see, ships are still being refurbished in these very docks today. Trains and locomotives from the maritime line used to come out onto Falmouth docks. If you look carefully, you can still see that some of the tracks remain today. The steam engines in Falmouth docks assisted the cleaning and maintenance of the oil ships. A dangerous manoeuvre performed by the engines was to pull the large ships into the dry dock. All the engines had a knife installed in the cab to cut the towing rope if the ship was going to pull the locomotive into the sea. Despite the nearby maritime line going diesel in 1962, the last working steam locomotive in Cornwall left the docks in 1986. Here I am at Redroof Railway Station, walking across the original footbridge. Even its name tells us the history of this town. The name Red Roof comes from Red River. This is due to the local hills being full of iron, which dyes the water red. Counterintuitively, red means river, and roof means red. All aboard. Although iron gave Red Roof its name, tin mining put this town on the map. I can almost line up this photograph of Red Roof in the turn of the 20th century. I'm going to grab a cup of tea at the station buffet over here. Let's see what Rosalind's getting up to. Wow, James, what a magnificent bridge. Meanwhile, I've come to Lapa Valley to get on a tiny steam train. There's no time for any of the children on this train to get bored, because it's only one mile long. Historically, this railway was to carry silver and tin from the nearby mines. Nowadays, it carries buggies. This is Lapa Valley Miniature Steam Railway, a tourist attraction for all the family. This pretty engine comes from Exmoor and used to be called Dennis. Now, it's had a sex change and it's called Ruby. This is the water tower to fill up the boiler with water. It would be really nice to get it when it, when it goes again. In December 2020, a morning swan on the tracks near Göttingen in Germany caused 20 trains to be cancelled. It was on the lines because its partner flew into the overhead lines above and sadly died. Some firefighters had to use specialist equipment to remove the swan from the overhead power lines. Once you get to Lapa Valley Tourist Centre, you might notice some mining heritage. Here is a hundred foot chimney. And this engine house had a 100-inch engine built by Harvey Foundry in Hale. Wow, these tracks are very narrow. In fact, they're just 15 inches wide and it's called minimum gauge. This is because it's the minimum width you can have for a train. Booth reopened this railway into a tourist attraction in the 1970s. Eric Booth was also contested as the inventor of a lens. Not this type of lens, but a contact lens like 
like you might put in your eye. We're about to get on this train. It's tiny. <laughs> on the 4th of February 1905 and closed on its 62nd birthday. This locomotive is based on the British Railway APT and like the real one, it runs on diesel. This one got new bogies in 2018. T stands for Advanced Passenger Train. But obviously for us, that's just here for a bit of fun. I've just been informed by a member of staff that you can't put out a diesel fire with water because it will just burst up into more flames. Instead, you have to use sand, like this. The train driver is refilling with coal. Luckily, he's got a handy store underneath the seat. Day, our shortest working day, and uh, over 300,000 pounds a year. That's wow. It's very wet and I was very cold. I was going to say, when. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, it was very wet. I've done all my jobs and I'm just sat in Timing it, yeah. Goodness me. Yeah. So, how long does it take to get up? Like 30 it seconds? Down, it goes up and down twice in a minute. You can't put too much luggage on a train, otherwise, it just won't get up the hill. So, you have to check how much baggage you're taking on with you. Luckily mine weighs two and a half kilograms, so I think I'm all right. Train. I'm getting a bit peckish. I think it's time to get the train out of the valley. I'm here at Tesco car park. As you can see, behind me there's a carriage. But why is that? Very close to here is the birthplace of Richard Trevithick, who was the first man to invent the steam engine. I'm wearing a steam engine here, and I've also just found a relative of Richard Trevithick. Just on the roundabout over there, there's a replica of a steam engine. Let's go and have a look at it. There's the steam engine. You can hardly see it because it's covered in shrubbery, but it is there. Steam trains are extremely hungry for fuel, much like humans. Are you able to reach the hand sanitizers? Luckily I haven't got a big carriage behind me. <laughs> I think that would annoy people. <laughs> We're making a documentary about railways. There we go, there's the flapjacks. Do you, know? Do you think I can pay for them? Yeah, yeah I've got it, thank you. Don't want the steam train getting scurvy. Sorry, am I in your way? Oh. Here I've got a genuine piece of steam coal given to me by Jimmy James at Bodmin and Wenford Railway. Here I've got some flapjacks, which are what I like to keep me going. I love driving my steam train. Talking of Jimmy James, let's find out more about how he came to drive a steam train. I'm Jimmy James. We're at the Bodmin and Wenford Steam Railway at Bodmin General Station and I am the railway's press and publicity officer. Well, as a boy, in the 1950s, all I wanted to do was drive a steam train. But then the steam trains all disappeared and my parents had other ideas. So I joined the Royal Navy and I was trained by them as a meteorologist. I also did that in the offshore oil industry. I was also in the army. 
as a bog standard infantry officer. But all I ever wanted to do was drive a steam train. As I got older and the steam preservation movement appeared and all these preserved railways appeared all over the country requiring volunteers. So here we are. Well I came along as a volunteer in 1991 and the first thing I did was over in the station there was pull up all the old floorboards but uh, I very soon got onto the engines and started to train to be a fireman. Became a fireman through to driving and now I'm a guard. We are a typical Cornish branch line and most of our engines are from the old Great Western Railway. Cora, I'm puffed out from all this walking. I hope James waits for me at the station. But before we get there, let's look at this majestic tin miner behind me. Now, it was the miners themselves that caused the birth of the Cornish pasty here in Cornwall. The miners could take it down with them into the mines, hold it by the crust, and they wouldn't get any dirt on the pie. There's an old saying in Cornwall that you're never more than 300 yards from a pasty shop. I'd better catch a train now. Coming up Camborne Hill, coming down. Going up Camborne Hill, coming down. The horses stood still. The wheels went around. Going up Camborne Hill, coming down. Bye. White stockings, white stockings she wore. White stockings, white stockings she wore. I knew her father, I did, or something like that. Going up Camborne Hill, coming down. From the end of steam in the 1960s, diesel locomotives became the workhorses of Cornwall's railways. Today, Japanese Hitachis run the main line. Although they are electric engines, Cornwall does not have any powered rails or cables for trains to pick up power. This means they must still use diesel when travelling through the county. White stockings, white stockings she wore White stockings, white stockings she wore Hail! That's where we are. Same as before Going up Cameron Hill, coming down That's not the way to the station. Yes, if you want to go to Penzance. Hail doesn't have a footbridge for passengers to go over the line. Therefore, passengers have to go under the railway in order to get to the other platform. The wheels turned around, going up Cameron Hill, coming down. From here, we can just about see over the water to the Lant station. I'm old, old, old man. I'm old, old man. The Lant station is on the St Ives branch. But not many people use it. Look at this bit of stone. It looks jet black. Maybe because it might be jet. We might miss the train. He played in the van, going up Cameron Hill, coming down. We've just got off the train here at St. Air. This is Cornwall's busiest station and the start of the branch line to St. Ives. in that signal box. I didn't know signal boxes were still in use. How do signals work, James? Old-fashioned semaphore signals like the one behind us use the visual cues to the driver to warn for upcoming danger. Currently, the bar is horizontal. This means there's an obstruction in the line ahead, most notably a train. So the driver must stop. When the bar drops, it means the line is clear, notifying that a new train can come through. was the last line to be built to Brunel's broad gauge specification. In 1892, the line, as well as all other railways in Cornwall, was converted from the broad gauge to the standard gauge in just one weekend. The broad gauge is seven foot and a quarter inches wide. 
while the standard gauge is only four foot eight and a half inches wise. <sighs> right, should we go and go and find the next cup of, cup of tea? Yeah, let's. I'm also really looking for tea. Beautiful. I feel like I could paint it. If you did, it could make it into one of the many art galleries in St Ives. Oh yeah, it's 1512. Maybe I watch this then. My watch is way fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> the St Ives branch is only four and a quarter miles long. This means it only takes between 10 and 13 minutes to go along the entire line. That was nice. <laughs> much needed, much needed as well. <laughs> oh. We have travelled on so many trains. Without going backwards and forwards, we have done all 145 miles of Cornwall's railways. The station here in Penzance was built in 1852. But it was replaced by this beautiful arch structure in 1879. That's unusual, they've got the ultrasonic scan unit in at the moment. Oh yeah. Oh and look, I think that used to be a sleeper. Mm. <laughs> Why are you chuckling? doesn't say Penzance, he says men's pants. Here at Penzance, you can even get on the train in your pyjamas. The Night Riviera is one of the last sleeper trains left in the UK. You can hop on the train here at 10 and get off at London Paddington the next morning. Or if you need an earlier night, you can use the lounge. Did you know Penzance is famous for its piracy? In fact, Gilbert and Sullivan even wrote a comic opera about them, The Pirates of Penzance. Penzance marks the end of the Cornish Main Line. But if you'd like to travel on to the Scilly Isles, you can catch the Salonian from this very port. It's Atlantic waters out there, Rosalind. Do you get seasick by any chance? I don't get seasick, James, myself, but I have heard that the Salonian is also called the sick bucket because it's renowned for making even the strongest of stomachs turn. <sighs> Penzance has a massive drug problem. Drugs are brought in from the Atlantic waters and taken to shore in lobster pots. Oh look, that's the train station where we're yeah. from. So we could keep going inside the shelter and you live. I've done that, I've cycled that one. Yeah. What were you saying earlier about your intro? Yeah. Do you want our feet moving? You might think that these palm trees would seem more at home in the Bahamas than here in England. However, Penzance has the mildest climate in the UK. Sadly, we've come to the end of our journey here at Cornwall's most southerly terminus. The duchy is blessed to be crisscrossed by so many wondrous railways. I'm Rosalind. And I'm James. And, and you, you have, have been, been watching, watching Railways of Cornwall. Cornwall.
Do you remember when I fell off that train? That was a little embarrassing. That yeah. was a little embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like such a high one and they yeah. told us that it was high. Yeah, and you had had the announcement and it was a wide gap. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and then do you remember yeah. that there was the train conductor and the train yeah. conductor laughed at me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> but luckily it happened the one time. It's just the it's just yeah. the yeah. Um, yeah.